Hey everyone, this is Ben Bowman and Alex Titus. Welcome back to the Oregon Bridge. We've had some very, very serious problems in our child welfare system. Problem with this is that it does sound like something from a horror movie that's too creepy to be real. And that makes it hard to work on because the resistance that I get is that can't possibly be true. And the kids have been telling us this forever, but we're not listening to them. All of these different facilities, the kids unsolicited would say, I'm only here because I'm so bad, nobody in Oregon wants me. And to have a kid believe that their entire state does not want them is just unfathomable to me. All right, everyone. Today, uh, we have a very interesting guest. State Senator Sarah Gelser was our guest, and uh, it was a fascinating episode. But before we give you a preview, um, I want to plug a joint venture that the Oregon Bridge is about to embark on with our friends at the Oregon Way. Uh, the Oregon Way is a Substack newsletter. on. Uh, it's basically an op-ed page for civic leaders to provide their input on the future of Oregon. Uh, we're teaming up to do a newsletter, um, which we will talk more about in the coming weeks. But for now, Google the Oregon Way, sign up to subscribe to the Substack, and you'll get a rundown of the week's most important political news stories on campaigns, elections, and government. Um, and we hope it's useful for you. So go subscribe to the Oregon Way. Now, for this episode, um, Sarah Gelser is a fascinating figure in Oregon politics. She's a former school board member, former state representative, and current state senator, but she's also had uh, involvement and recognition at the national level. Um, she was Time Person of the Year for her role in um, the Me Too movement at the Oregon um, state legislature level. Uh, she was appointed by President Barack Obama to uh, serve on a the National Council on Disability. Uh, and she's been a leader on children's issues in the state legislature, particularly um, foster care and children with special needs. Um, she's really like the go-to person in the state legislature. And I'll just say briefly, um, we covered some ground at the beginning um, that I think is interesting. It, we talk about Me Too, we talk about sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, we talk a little bit about you know urban rural divide, conservative voters. But the second half of this episode where we talk about uh, Oregon's child welfare system and foster children in particular and the work she's done and what she's seen, it was mind boggling. And I say this as someone who's been following the issue, right? I read the, I read the, the, the reporting in the Oregonian, um, which is exceptional reporting, but to hear her describe what she saw, um, what these kids experienced, what this, what the government of the state of Oregon did and allowed to happen, which I say as a progressive, um, it was astounding and alarming um, and just really something that I think more people need to hear. So uh, Titus, what did you think? Uh, biggest takeaways, most important things for this episode? Yeah, I mean, honestly, the, uh, the, the treatment of the foster kids by the state is just horrendous. Uh, I mean, I knew a little bit about this issue before and I actually wish that we would have spent more of the episode just talk. Maybe we'll have to have her back just to do a full episode on this. I think that would yeah. be really interesting, but uh, I mean, in short, the, the state government was essentially shipping kids to different states uh, and putting them in these awful centers. And some of them would even end up as far as states like Michigan, uh, which, of course, my family is from Michigan. It is a very long flight to get from uh, Detroit to Portland, Oregon. And it's not a fun flight either. Uh, to me, it's just crazy that the state government basically allowed this to to press on. And I think that this is a, such a, you know, strong issue that could have bipartisan support and that, you know, Republicans and Democrats could really address together. So uh, and, I'm really glad that she's, you know, working her butt off on this issue and she won't back down. She clearly gets, I think, rightfully really emotionally by it. And I think as she told us kind of off camera, she's like, I really, really care about this. And this, this is my goal to address this. So uh, it was really powerful to hear from her. And it was really just insightful to learn more about it. And an excerpt from the OPB reporting on this issue, so you can hear the scope of it. Uh, OPB said that these children were, quote, drugged and largely abandoned by state workers. They were shipped to other states so that in those states they could do things that are not legal in Oregon in terms of restraints, in terms of um, prescriptions or medications. Um, uh, really an, an alarming and um, and wild, wild policy issue. But what I will say is uh, Senator Gelser talks about what has been done and we're in a much better place now than we were um, two years, four years, six years ago. So with that, we'll just jump straight into the episode. Thank you all for listening. Um, Titus, you wanna plug the YouTube and the Twitter? 
Of course. Uh, make sure to follow us on Twitter at Orkin Bridge Pod and make sure to check us out on YouTube because, uh, of course, no one wants to spend, you know, uh, you want to spend as much time looking at Ben and I on camera as possible, <laughs> staring in, in, in my kitchen uh, with, with my lovely background I have here. So you can just type in Oregon Bridge Podcast on YouTube and you'll be able to find us there too. Uh, we have the audio and the video there as well uh, in case you're interested in that. So definitely uh, check us out on Twitter, check us out on YouTube. Uh, and also feel free to send us an email if you have any thoughts. Our email is OregonBridgePodcast at gmail.com. Uh, we'd love to hear your feedback or if you have guest ideas or anything like that. Uh, we really want to hear from you. So feel free to reach out. And as always, a huge shout out to Buddy Terry, our producer, who puts together the audio files for podcasts and also does all the video editing for YouTube. Um, Buddy is the man. And we're going to have a Buddy Terry uh, podcast episode sooner or later. So stay tuned for that. But thanks again, everyone, and enjoy the rest of the episode. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. We are pleased today to welcome a very special guest, Senator Sarah Gelser. Uh, Senator, it's the waning days of session. How are you doing? How are you feeling? Any gas left in the tank? Well, first of all, thanks for having me. This is a good way to wrap up the week, but you know, I'm excited. We're starting to get the big things on the floor and see the, the end of, of work that has been underway for a really long time. It has been a, a wild session. There's lots of things to talk about, um, but I wanted to start by kind of zooming out a little bit. As I was doing research for this um, for this episode, I read an article written by Jeff Mapes back when he was at the Oregonian many years ago, and it was when you and um, Senator Riley were just uh, transitioning from the House to the Senate, mm -hmm. and um, the premise was basically how you were hoping to change the Senate. Um, because this was back when there was a razor thin majority, um, one seat, and uh, the reputation then was the Senate is where good bills go to die. Uh, and many folks, I would argue, still hold that to be true. Um, <laughs> but I'm curious, you know, you, you joined the Senate in 2014. In what ways has the Senate changed? And in what ways do you see it as basically being the same institution it was um, eight years ago or whatever? You know, uh, Representative Janelle Bynum, who is one of my favorite people in the world, told me a few years ago that the foundations of the House are sturdy and they are they are hard to shake and not the House of Representatives, but just the House in general. So I, you know, I think the the structural setup of the House and the Senate it is pretty firm and is very difficult to change. That said, I think in the time that I have been in the Senate, we have seen profound changes, not just in the Senate, but in the legislature as a whole. We're more diverse. I think that we have more uh, voice from rank and file members. I think that this session, uh, one of the unexpected outcomes of the virtual session is that while people cannot be in the building, in some ways it's opened up participation to people that haven't been able to do so before. Mm -hmm. And I think his right size, the power of the regular person's voice as compared to, to those that are play, uh, paid to be in the building. So I think I can't take accountability or responsibility for that, but I think we've seen those types of changes. Certainly I have worked hard to elevate kind of the status and consideration of staff in the Senate to uh, add my voices along with others of my progressive colleagues to uh, progressive um, values and also have tried to maintain civility and friendship um, with, with friends on both sides of the aisle. So a couple, couple follow-ups there. One, um, you mentioned uh, the rank and file legislators. One, one critique that I've heard from some legislators, some lobbyists actually, is that as the presiding officers have gained more experience in both chambers, that the power of committee chairs has been concentrated back up to the top of the leadership ladder um, and that the, the, the institution is less democratic, little d democratic than it, than it was, I don't know, before I was around you know, 10, 15, whatever years ago. Do, does that ring true to you or do you have a different take? This is not a, a criticism of either of the presiding officers in any way, but I do think that it is a fair question to think about the state of Oregon has decided to have term limits for the governor, mm -hmm. um, um, just kind of for, for positions where power is very centralized. I do not support term limits for the legislature, to be clear. Me neither. <laughs> um, so I, that is not where I'm going. But I do think that 
it is an interesting question about in a state that has term limits for a governor, is it appropriate to have presiding officers that can serve across multiple governors? And what does that mean about power and where it gets concentrated and how agendas move forward and how often there is an opportunity to reevaluate values and, and goals within the system. Now, again, that has nothing to do with these two individuals. That is not a criticism of them. But I think as that um, as those positions shift moving forward, I hope that's a conversation that we have when we talk about modernizing the legislature and making sure that we're staying uh, true to the to the democratic tenets. Certainly with experience in a presiding officer's office, uh, there are things that can be handled very well and with a great deal, deal of skill. I think I would point to, um, I think Speaker Kotek has really managed some very difficult situations this year with, uh, with a great deal of gravitas and calm. I would point to the uh, expulsion of Mike Nearman yesterday as one of those. I think that experience helped to keep that pretty low drama. So there's certainly benefits, but um, there, there's a lot of power in that presiding officer's office. The more experience you have, the more relationships you have, the more powerful that office becomes. For sure. I appreciate the nuanced take because I think that is the, the trade-off is I think you could argue, well, there's there's several arguments you can make about both presiding officers being the right person at the right moment. Um, but Speaker Kotek in particular, I think the the weight of the progressive agenda that she's been able to move through in her tenure is pretty remarkable. Um, but the trade-off is uh, you know, you don't see you don't see things move out of committee that aren't aligned with that agenda. Um, et cetera, et cetera. But it, an interesting conversation and, you know, with the governor's race coming up and Peter Courtney perhaps coming closer to his retirement, um, we could be in for a really significant shakeup in leadership over the next uh, two to four years. Um, I think that's true. And I, I think the Senate has changed a lot with positions turning over. The Senate Democratic Caucus is a very different Democratic Caucus than it was in 2014. And the same is true for the Republican caucus, which mm -hmm. is going through its own transformation and struggles. And the one thing I would say about Peter Courtney that it's easier to see from inside the Senate. I served in the House for a really long time and you know, understood that idea. I kind of ran on it. Uh, good ideas go to the Senate to die. That's where they all get killed. <laughs> well, the, the Senate is a very different type of chamber to manage than the House. There's far fewer people. There's far less room for, for disagreement. You lose one or two people and you can't move something forward. And I think that I have now seen Peter Courtney behind the scenes bring progressive priorities forward that would not have happened without him. And he doesn't get the, the credit for, for that. Um, and he takes the blame for a lot of things that don't move because at the end of the day, he cannot make people vote a certain way. I mean, it, we all own our own votes. And you know, frankly, that's the way that it should be even when it doesn't work out the way that I want it to. You mentioned in um, in your previous an answer, Mike Nearman, and so I want to I want to turn to uh, an issue that has kind of put you at the front and center um, nationally, definitely in the state in terms of workplace um, culture in the state legislature. And I was just thinking to myself, since I've been sort of paying attention to politics, um, Oregon politics, state legislative politics. It's field folk. I started as an intern. Um, uh, you know, I think it was in 20, 2012. And so some of the names that I remember, and not trying to create an equivalence of these people or what they did, but you've got Mike Schaffler, Jeff Cruz, Brian Boquist, David Gomber, Diego Hernandez, Brad Witt, Mike Nearman, um, people whose names have surfaced because of something they did at work to var uh, varying levels of severity. Um, one thing you notice about that list is there's Democrats, there's Republicans, there's senators, there's, um, uh, there's representatives. There's also numerous legislative staff and lobbyists whose names I won't include here, but who many folks know about. Um, you have kind of played an interesting role in this in, in sort of a whistleblower, I guess you could be described. You obviously were the time person of the year um, during the Me Too movement for the courage you showed bringing this forward. Um, but then this session happens and you know the Representative Hernandez issue and the Representative Nearman issue and it, it's a lot of people I think are wondering, is this getting worse? Like is the is the legislature actually a less safe place to work than it was when this all really hit the national spotlight a couple of years ago? Um, you know, what is your perspective as someone who's who's in the building both physically and sort of metaphorically and attuned to the conversations that are happening? Um, I'm I'm curious, like, what do you make of the last couple of years? You know, if you aren't feeling well and you go to the doctor and you think you've got a flu or 
you know, an infection and you end up getting an MRI and it turns out that you have, you know, tumors and this very significant illness and you continue to get more sick. It's not because you had the MRI, it's because the MRI um, kind of opened the window to be able to see what was underneath. And I think as we work through this process, what we're really looking at more than anything else is culture change. And with most, but not all of the situations that we've seen in the Capitol, and I would actually include um, Senator Cruz in this group, what you've seen is a a shift of values and expectations over time and how people have moved along with those values and expectations that have shifted and where the tipping point is for where um, kind of broader communities are willing to accept kind of people holding on to, to old ways. You know, I think for me, and, and this is this is before knowing about what happened with the interns, that was absolutely unacceptable. Um, and what, you know, my experiences with him were also unacceptable, but the power differential was different. I, if when we had first approached that, if he had said, I wanna learn more about this, I'm gonna do a better job, I, I would have been great with that. I didn't, I didn't need him to go away altogether mm-hmm. until it became clear that this was a pervasive problem that, that, was not, that was not getting better. My hope is that as we move on, we'll see more of, of that, of, of people responding and trying to figure out what they, what they didn't understand. How can they do that better? And that the rest of us that are watching can also learn from those things to think about how do I write my text messages? Um, how do I um, manage a political disagreement? I mean, you can just go all through the all through those things. How do I manage relationships mm-hmm. with people that I have inside inside the building? So I don't I don't think it's worse. I think it is a mistake to think because we created a process that that took care of the problem. Our issue was was partially a process problem. We didn't have a way to deal with those things, but more than anything else, it really was a culture problem. My disappointment has been, I, I think that we've seen what I would call some misuse of, of the system. Um, and and that, I'm not pointing to any of the things that happened this year, but early on, like right after the adjournment of the, of the 2019 session that has maybe lost sight of where we started and what this process was intended to, to cover and, and to take care of. The, the other thing is that there's a real difference between what we're talking about in those names that in most of those names that you listed and I would put Representative Nierman in a different place altogether, where yeah. you're talking about a, a criminal act that is beyond, you know, you can argue, was it just bad judgment? Who knows? But it was dangerous. That, I think, is different than workplace workplace culture. It's a, that, that is a different level of, of concern. So I do want to add, maybe I won't call it a counterpoint, but at least uh, I'd be really interested in your insight on this, is it seems like on the state level, though, these issues are being addressed, I would say, in a more practical way than maybe on the national level. And what I mean by that is that right now you have Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York, and he's been accused by, uh, I think, at least four, and I think more women of some form of either sexual harassment or unwanted advances, uh, been Republican members of Congress who have been accused of the same thing by multiple women. I think that a few of them have resigned, but a few of them may may still be seated. But it seems at least when you look at the polling and sort of the outcomes, at least where we are now, that, uh, you know, people when they're polled by their own party seem to say, no, I'm going to stick with my guy or I'm going to stick with my gal, despite these allegations. At least we've seen this in larger races or on the national level. But it seems like at least in Oregon, uh, that maybe all of the sort of desired outcomes aren't happening, but at least that there is some some more accountability there, uh, and maybe that is just kind of the nature of of Oregon being a smaller state, more local. Uh, you know, uh, different attitude I would say than in places like, like New York and Washington D.C. as well. Uh, but I would be kind of curious to that because you know, Ben, you said that it seems like it's maybe getting worse, but I would say at least looking at it from the state level compared to the national level, I think it, those issues are being resolved at a, a much better pace. Uh, but I'd be really curious of your thoughts on that. You know, I, I think we're, I think we're trying and it's a, it's a hard and inexact process that, that one, we can't have the expectation that it's ever going to be easy. It's, it's never a person that steps forward with a complaint is going through an incredibly difficult time. There is no way to make that perfectly comfortable or um, like something anybody wants to do. I mean, it's just not a, 
it's not a situation anybody wants to be in and that the process by its very nature is is messy. So we have to be careful what we promise to people. But I do think that we have demonstrated, the legislature has demonstrated a commitment to try to figure out how to address this. I think what's next is, is figuring out what's the scale of things. How do you how do you sort the severity of a behavior, both in terms of the response to being called out on a behavior, the impact of the behavior, the pervasiveness of the behavior, the number of people that it that it impacts. How do you make sure that that is always fair? How do you take account of the fact that we are ultimately a political body and there are political ramifications to everything that we do. So the pressures that sit on people are, are weighty. I mean, last night um, with the expulsion of Mike Nierman, I'm not in the house, I watched it, my, my stomach hurt. That is a, that is a um, profound vote to, to take, to expel someone that has been elected by their community. And I think that that was, a particularly challenging vote for many of my my friends in the Republican caucus who have pressures on them for a variety of different reasons that had nothing to do with the incident itself that occurred. And mm -hmm. I am grateful that we have a state where we were able to get past that and have that outcome and not have it be a circus. And I, I think it was actually very dignified and respectful process yesterday and, and last night and, and both parties contributed to that in, you know, in my opinion. Yeah. I I, and I think the other thing that we have is is commitment on both sides of the aisle. At the beginning of this, uh, you know, Senator Tim Knope, uh, Republican from Bend, was an extraordinary support to me going through that process with Jeff Cruz through the entire two-year process that it unfolded. And he didn't do that for political reasons. Um, you know, Representative Noble texted me last night, we were talking about something else. And he said, you know, it's never the wrong time to do the right thing. And I, I think we have enough people that are serving that have that attitude, that that's helping us not just sweep it under the rug and move on. Yeah, it, it was a remarkable vote. And for those who didn't who didn't see it or, or, or who have forgotten, it was unanimous, except for Mike Nierman. <laughs> Every Republican voted for her. Um, his expulsion and it there was a New Yorker article several weeks ago that said Andrew it was I think the title was something like Andrew Cuomo Matt Gates and the politics of never resigning and I think that's the other piece of this Titus is like unless like politicians aren't going to resign anymore that's my view like regardless of the allegations yeah, I, I, I agree I think I, I think you admit defeat at this point by resigning uh, so but if you stay in office basically you can seem to be able to get past these things. But but the implication of that is in Oregon, I think the institutions are strong enough and the balance of power is strong enough. Like, I don't want to get into the details of this. Um, I, you know, I'm actually a big fan of Governor Kitzhaber, but like the, the legislative branch very quickly exercised its power to sort of force a resignation there in a way that, um, and I don't know actually the constitutional provisions that would have allowed his removal. I don't think the legislature could unilaterally remove him um, but, uh, like Cuomo is not going to resign. It just isn't going to happen. And so, um, what I think is unique is Nearman wasn't going to resign either, but the legislature actually took the action, which I think is encouraging in terms of how Oregon handles problems versus maybe other States. But I know let's, uh, let's transition Titus. I know you've got a, a, pol a, a broader political question. Yeah. So yeah, no, it's a, it's, it's a really interesting one, but yeah, we'll go ahead and transition here. Uh, so Senator, so you represent a district that, uh, not only includes a deep blue city, but also a lot of rural and conservative voters too. And one thing that we like to talk about on the show a lot is what we call the urban-rural divide. And what I mean by that, and our listeners will probably want to kill me because they've heard me say this 20 <laughs> times now, but if you're a new listener, maybe this is the first time you've heard me say it, uh, that it seems that a lot of the wealth, cultural power, jobs, and economic drivers are shifting away from rural areas where they even once existed if they did into major urban suburban areas and things like that. And those people seem to be continuously left behind uh, on a more basis. And obviously part of this show, we want to explore ways where we can really help to bridge that divide, help to bring our communities together. So as I was saying before, I mean, you you really represent what I would say are both of those people. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious from your perspective, what do you think it, actually, I'd be curious, is that even a good framing of the issue itself? And then if so, I mean, you know, what do you think are, are ways that maybe we should go about helping to, you know, helping to, to, to resolve these sorts of issues or even just helping to think about them? So in my community, I would frame it a little bit differently. If you're talking about rural or urban, my district is, is neither. <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, you have 
you're not a remote area where you have to plan to go get your, your gallon of milk in the area that I, that I represent. And it is easier to buy recreational marijuana in my district than it is to buy a pair of children's shoes. I mean, you have to travel to, you know, Salem or Portland or Eugene uh, in order to, you know, get some basic goods uh, in this, in this area, kind of um, merchant types but, of. But there's marijuana shops everywhere. Oh my gosh, everywhere. That is uh, that is unified across both halves of my district. Very definitely more uh, firearm stores in the um, in the Albany half of my district. Definitely more yoga studios in the Corvallis <laughs> part of my district. As uh, Alex Garlotto said on our show, Oregonians love their guns and pot. So that doesn't surprise <laughs> me. They love their guns and pot. And, uh, you know, our goat yoga was kind of kind of in the middle of the of the two districts, which I thought was relatively appropriate. But I, you know, I do think that there is this, you know, we call it an urban rural divide. I think it is really a, a values and uh, and worldview divide more than something that is geographic. And, and sometimes I think it is harder to address those issues if we focus on the geography of it. So I will have people write to me that say, all you care about is Portland and you know what's, you know, what are you doing about what's happening in downtown Portland? And to me, I'm like, I hardly ever go to Portland. I always get lost. And I've lived here for like 25 years and anything north of Woodburn is Portland. Uh, you know, I, you know, I really think Beaverton, Wilsonville, all of that to me, it's just all Portland. I know that is not the way that my um that my colleagues see it but as a tiger as a tiger citizen i'm deeply offended by this but (laughs) we'll allow it (laughs) like the eugene springfield corvallis philomath kind of thing so i but it, it really shuts down the conversation a little bit so if if people blame portland politics or portland centric I immediately think, well, this conversation doesn't apply to me. I I don't represent Portland. I don't understand Portland. I don't, you know, that's not, that's not where I'm coming from. We have very unique needs in this part of the state as well. And, And there are many things that hold the two halves of my district together in terms of of interests. I do think that there is a divide in um how people choose to pursue education. And I don't want to say an education level because I think that's really insulting. And I don't I don't think a, a degree is equated to intelligence or ability to participate in society or any of those things. But you know, in my in my district, if you look at the education profile, there's a university in my district. I believe Corvallis has more PhDs per capita than any other city west of the Mississippi River. Wow. And in Albany, we have a lot of people that are in the trades and the professions. I mean, all very highly accomplished people that have chosen very different paths, but those paths also lead to some very different very different worldviews and and framing um, of of ideas. So I, I I think that is more where the issue is rather than than rural or urban. I don't think it's all about you know obviously there's divides about timber and there's divides about about tax, but a lot of the ag issues, for instance, are about about tax. I mean my my local heating company is going to say the same thing to me as my local farmer or my trucking company. So it's not really rural or urban it's 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 tax and what's the role of government sure and so maybe even a little of an insider baseball question but we had uh jamie mcleod skinner on the podcast she was one of the first episodes that we did mm-hmm. and one of her complaints actually in terms of the urban rural divide was not even just the issues that are highlighted but also actually power structure within the party she basically said you know, uh, I'll, I'll paraphrase, so I won't try to quote her exactly, just so I don't misquote her, but that a lot of the sort of decisions for the Democratic Party, which I think are more important at this point than the Republican Party, since the Democrats control everything, a lot of that sort of power base basically flows from Portland. Uh, and that that's sort of where the main brokers are. That's where maybe the party bosses are. It feels a little crazy to call someone in Oregon a party boss because <laughs> we're not New York City. But, uh, but you know, that's where the party bosses are. Maybe that's where the primary activists are. Uh, I'm curious from your perspective, do you see some truth in that? Do you disagree with that? Uh, just kind of curious of that as well. And I think her critique was actually broader. It was, um, she, I don't know if she'd go all the way down to uh, Corvallis, but hers was I-5 corridor, uh, Willamette uh, yeah. but primarily Portland for sure. Right. I, uh, proximity means power. I mean, you, you can't, if you're not there, 
you can't participate in the conversation. You're not setting the agenda, you're a guest. So I, I think that there's a, a piece of it where you have a larger concentration of people, more power is going to flow from, from that location. So I think it's, it's natural that you have a lot that comes from the metro area. I think that's something, I don't think I'm the only kind of downstate legislator that has that frustration. Every event is in, is in the Portland area. It's a lot of driving. That's something else I've really liked um, that I hope that we retain after the pandemic. I've been better able to participate in meetings and in events because I can just log on to my Zoom. It's not a commitment of an entire day where for most of my colleagues, it's a commitment of a couple of hours. So I, I think that's just a, a logistical piece and, and how people know each other. I mean, politics is like everything else. It's relationships. I It's not... I can't just go have a drink or go bowling or have my colleagues over for dinner. For a long time, I had to, with the exception of Representative Rayfield, and when I was in the House and there was no Representative Rayfield, there was Senator Morris, I had to drive 45 minutes at least to get to the nearest elected legislative Democrats. So there, there really wasn't the ability to build those same kinds of relationships. I think you see a similar power structure in the Eugene area. You've got your Lane County caucus, we're so um, divided here that that's not necessarily the case. But I, you know, I think we've always had good bipartisan collaboration across our legislative delegations in Lynn and Benton County and, and the area to be able to work together on, on things that broadly matter to the to the communities as a whole. Awesome. I don't know that that really answered your question, but I, I, I think it's I think that really is geography. It's the proximity and well, relationship. It's a different lens to the same sort of issue, I think, for sure. Um, I've got one more political question, then we want to jump to policy. Uh, and this is something I love to talk about. Um, but so you're, you're one of the rare legislators in Salem who will occasionally uh, crit criticize openly her members of her own party and members of leadership. And I find that interesting for several reasons, but one, because, so I work with a lot of high school students um, in a couple of like mentorship programs. And I, fr I have a framework that I use to kind of explain different approaches once you're an elected official. And one frame is like Nancy Pelosi, who I think, you know, love or hate her, a very effective politician who was able to move her agenda forward, but really had to be a team player for a long time and took a lot of punches, but really, um, with uh, sort of like persevered through a long period of time before she came speaker or um, majority leader. And then on the other hand, you have this new um, new way to approach politics, maybe not new, but unique in Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, who basically has this recognition, I'm never gonna be speaker. This party is never gonna make me leadership, um, but by, by occasionally criticizing or pushing or trying to pull people along cl closer to her, her version of what she wants, um, that's her greatest way to make an impact. Um, so I wonder what you think about that framework and how on the Oregon level you see you see yourself fitting, um, or do you think the Oregon political system, because we all know each other and it's super small state, it doesn't quite apply here? And that's a really interesting question. I think the dynamic is is different here, obviously, than, than AOC and figuring out how you can move and get things done. And um, you know, I think it is frankly right now a lot easier to get transformative things done in a state legislature than it is in, in Congress. You can, sure. you can work faster, you can work more directly with people and you can make things happen. And I, I think on a day-to-day -day basis, I can't speak to how anybody else thinks about it, but for me, I know why I ran. I know uh, what my values are. I know what I promised to my community. And I try to think about what does it take to, to get that done uh, and not to violate my values or other people's in the process, um, I, I think I I also have a perspective. I you know spent a long time in a Quaker community, and um, you know kind of a perspective uh, that comes out of uh, you know friends, uh, the Society of Friends, is that you know everybody has a piece of a piece of the light. Everybody has that of God within them. So you can't do something unless you're talking a little bit to everyone. The flip side of that is all of us are kind of messed up sometimes. We make mistakes. We do things wrong. And unless we confront those and address those and move forward with them, um, we're never going to be able to, to change it. So I don't think that if I'm going to speak out about a bill or an action that I should check my cheat sheet first to see you know, what the political party is of, of the person. Values are values, they, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't shift from party to party. I also think we have a lot more in common than we don't. And um, we need to, to work together as often as we can. I would also say when I have criticized folks in my party, um, sometimes that has gone more broadly than what my intention ha has been. And that's been pretty 
pretty uncomfortable. I, I think the the bully report, there were things that I thought I was sharing in a confidential deposition for background that were not kind of oh, really? intended to be, hmm. you know, out there uh, in the in the world about my colleagues, because you, I mean, you have that in a, in a vacuum and certainly in that interview uh, where there were some very critical things that I said, and I, and I believe those things, I also said some very positive things about all of those people um, and the, the challenges of, of rising to that occasion, um, you know, in, including that if the situation were reversed, I very well could have been the person that was doing those things because it was about a culture. It was about a culture change and how do we how do we respond to that? So I also don't believe you can just totally write somebody off forever. The, the Senate president and I have had some, some disagreements. I have great affection for him and I think he does some, some really great things. And um, I, I have great respect for him. And I assume and I expect and hope that sometimes people are disappointed in me. Um, I also think that as elected officials, we work too hard to insulate ourselves from, from criticism. As we've gone through that, that complaint process, to me, it's always been very important. As elected officials, we run for office, we put ourselves out there to be up, held to a higher standard. And our staff need to be able to say whatever they want to say about us. And we need to be open to those criticisms. And if we've done something wrong, we need to be able to, to fix it. But it is never appropriate for us to tell people that they shouldn't be uh, talking or criticizing, because if that's what we do, we are never, ever going to get better. And all of us can get better. One of the floor speeches of yours that I listened to, I wrote down a quote that I was going to ask in a previous question, but it's time for us to stop protecting the reputations of institutions and people in power, which I think most people would be like, yes, of course, but that's a hard thing to say on the floor of the Senate um, when you're addressing the presiding officer. Um, thanks for indulging the political questions. We have a couple of sort of wonky policy questions that I'm hoping you can translate to folks like Titus and I who aren't policy experts in these areas and listeners broadly who are interested. The first is child welfare and the foster care system, which um, anytime there are newspaper headlines about those two systems in this state, it seems like it's just really atrocious, um, scary news. Um, a couple of examples for, for listeners that I, I know you remember well, there was a report, I think it was 2017 about social workers in roughly half of the cases where they were doing child welf welfare checks were leaving a child in an unsafe house and unsafe um, living conditions. And then there's these really wild newspaper articles and um, the, the, the person has since revealed their name. We, I won't discuss that here, but children being shipped out of state essentially where they could be drugged and um, to quote OPB, uh, largely abandoned um, by the state because of like quirky, weird, different rules in different states. So we can send them to a different state and there's different rules that they wouldn't let us do in Oregon. Um, and when I think about you in the, in the, on, on these issues, I kind of think of Sisyphus because when I was an intern, you sort of had this reputation of like one time, I, I don't even have any clue what the issue was, but occasionally if you're a legislative staffer, people down the hall or in the cubicle next to you will be like, Hey, turn on human services. You got to see this. And one of those issues was like you and the director of human services were going at it. <laughs> and so you've been like poking the bear, pushing the boulder up the hill and yet there's still not consistently, but it still feels like semi-regularly there's revelations about just really atrocious things happening in the system. I also know you worked on the bureaucracy side of the system prior to your service in the legislature. So how do you feel about the child welfare system as it stands today? Have the, the, the Has the legislation you've pushed through made a dent or do you feel like this is just a massive bureaucracy that is so slow moving that we're still frankly endangering a lot of kids? So that's a, that's a lot. And you've like okay. tapped into my life passion. So um, we'll I buckle think, up. We'll, we'll buckle up. We're buckle, ready. Buckle up. So I, you know, I, um, we've had some very, very serious problems in our child welfare system. That goes without saying we have failed a bunch of kids who will continue to experience the consequences of that. I don't believe that that is entirely the responsibility of just child welfare. That's, it, it's not been, um, an issue until the last few years that that people have talked about openly. It's kind of the, the last thing. People don't like to talk about hard things that make them uncomfortable. Um, and I also need to say, while all those bad things were happening, there are also some really good things. We never hear the stories about all of the successes that, that happen and all of these workers that 
are getting kids out of unsafe situations who are, you know, working multiple hours and trying to find places to put them. I mean, this, this work is, is really hard. And I've always believed that even, and that the folks that are doing it are really committed. And I've, I've believed that even when I've been most critical, the system has seen substantial transformation. I'm proud to feel like I've played some role in that. Um, I think the biggest changes have happened over the course of the last year and a half uh, with a new child welfare director. Um, in the time that I've been doing child welfare issues as a chair in the Senate, we've been through something like five different child welfare directors. Wow. We now have a woman named Rebecca Jones Gaston. Wow. Um, she is extraordinary. She listens to the community. Um, she has experience in the system herself. Uh, she doesn't pull any punches, very, very transparent. And I, I am seeing real change. We still have more to do to, to be sure, but I'm seeing real change. We have brought every kid home from out of state. Um, those programs were terrible. Uh, out of Ways and Means came a, a bill that I introduced this session that will require the department to go to each of these out of state facilities and get all of the records, uh, including the videotapes and the audio tapes and the injury records and notify the kids that they have may have a right to civil remedy to sue these programs. And, and sorry, Literally. just to even, just to take a step back, can you just briefly explain what exactly, could, I, I remember reading about this a couple of years ago and mm -hmm. it was shocking, but I don't remember how were kids getting shipped to different states? Why was that even happening? Is that normal? Do other state foster care systems do that? Or was that like an Oregon thing or kind of, you have a little context there. Cause yeah, I mean, it, it truly is shocking when you hear that, right? Like that, that sounds like something from a horror movie, to be honest, or, you know, some sort of creepy movie or something like that. It doesn't sound like it could be real. Uh, but could you just give us a little bit of background of what exactly was happening and why why was that happening? Absolutely. And and before I do that, I just want to say that's part of the problem with this is that it does sound like something from a horror movie that's too creepy to be real. And that makes it hard to, to work on because the resistance that I get is that can't possibly be true. Surely you're exaggerating. Yeah. Like that can't actually be happening or that can't actually have happened more than once. And the kids have been telling us this forever, but we're not listening to them. So um Sending kids out of state was unusual for Oregon. Until about 2016, it was a very, very rare thing that happened. And when it did, it, it tended to be um, related to some very high, very specific high level need where there was a program that only had a specific type of a treatment or service. And it was much more short term. Um, beginning in 2016, 2017, there was a um, there was a, a settlement around kids sleeping in hotels and conference rooms. And we brought in a new child welfare director and what she was being evaluated on was how many kids were sleeping in, in hotel rooms. Around that time, this national company called Sequel saw that and saw the same thing in other places and came and started marketing and saying, we have places we can, we can help you with that. So we moved from having a handful of kids out of state uh, per year, um, all year long, to by the end of uh, 2018, we had nearly 90 kids out of state uh, on that day. We'd had close to 200 altogether. They were staying out of state for a very long period of time. And the state was actually in conversations about uh, reserving additional beds. The, the number of kids that were supposed to go away was increasing substantially. And the legislature didn't know about this. We learned about it from Lauren Dake, uh, the OPB reporter who called me and said, why are these kids out of state? And it took a while to figure it out and get the names. And that has become, that has taken over my life for the last several years. We held hearings every week, um, starting in the spring of 2019. We brought some of these executives here. We um, published records. I got thousands and thousands of pages of public records requests. So did Lauren Dake. We finally told DHS, just send them all to both of us at the same time because we're gonna share them anyway. Um, it's led to um, American public media. There was an hour long podcast on uh, the reveal. Uh, last month I was on a, a one hour special um, through NBC with Kate Snow that really looked at these programs. And since we started, I kind of feel like in Oregon, we, click, we flicked a domino. And since that time for the sequel program, the 14th program was announced to be being closed this week. Almost all the programs that we had kids in were closed. Acadia was another program that had our kids and a number of those have closed as well. And all of our kids are back. I started calling other states as well. We ratcheted up the media attention in those states. And I believe we're now up to seven states that will not do business with uh, SQL Youth and Family Services. And that was partly um, 
elevated by a death, there was a, a boy named Cornelius Frederick who died just over a year ago in an inappropriate restraint at a place called Lakeside Academy in Michigan. And what was devastating to me about that was that was the last of, um, I visited six different facilities in four different states over the course of nine months. And my last visit was to Lakeside. I sat with the SQL CEO and said, your restraint practices are dangerous. If you do not change them, a kid is gonna die. And just yards from where we had that conversation, Cornelius died just a couple oh of Oh my God, later. wow. Um, so, it, and we had two kids there at the time. We had two Oregon kids in that facility at that at that time. That facility so, is not closed. Uh, sorry, so just, just, to, just to clarify, there was two kids in the system from Oregon who were in Michigan? Uh, there were more than that in Michigan. There were two kids at that particular facility. But all had, the way from Oregon to Michigan? Yes, we had kids in wow. Michigan, okay. Iowa, Illinois, uh, Tennessee, um, a bunch of kids in Utah, in uh, Wyoming, in Idaho. I mean, they were everywhere and we weren't alone. What I've learned since then is many states have kids out of state. It's this giant industry. And they have these programs in many of the states, but what they do is they get kids from other states and, and that just creates this opaqueness where yep. no one's checking and no one is seeing what is happening to these kids. And the same thing happens on the private side. So, you know, some of the legislation that I still have this session, we've got restraints, but also looking at the private industry um, where, where wealthy families generally are hiring these education consultants and sending kids off to wilderness programs and therapeutic boarding schools where they're severely abused. And it starts with these unregulated transport companies that you can hire to come into your house in the middle of the night, kidnap your kid, essentially. They wake them up in the bed, they strip search them, they put them in handcuffs, they put blindfolds on them. Their instructions, if you go to the website, say to make sure your other kids aren't there, lock up the dogs. I mean, that's a bad sign if you're putting that on your advertising materials. So that all of those things are real and they are happening. And there's a movement now where people are, are just really talking about it. And what I've tried to do in my committee is bring those actual voices because nobody ever talks to the kids. So we had in this last session, we had Paris Hilton come, who is also that. working on this. And she's been a really interesting person to get to know. And a, a girl named Uvea. And you may have read about Uvea because the headline you mentioned was about Uvea. She was the nine-year-old that was in uh, Montana and she was being forcibly injected with, with drugs and nobody had checked on her. She was nine at the time. She testified in my hearing this spring on two different days via video and I can send you the YouTube. She is so powerful. And she said, I want people to know my name and I want people to know my story because this cannot happen to other children. Okay. And so, so <laughs> I, I'm going to, I'm going to, there's so much here. Um, yeah. I want to channel what I imagine a lot of um, listeners or just regular people are thinking, which is, okay, you're the chair of the Senate Human Services Committee. The newspapers are reporting on this. Why is it, why is it hard to stop that practice? Why can't the governor just say, okay, we're not doing this anymore. Or the director of the child welfare division be like, this is out of control. The practice stops tomorrow. Like why, why is it such a monumental effort with public records requests and hearings and pushing legislation through? I mean, it's, it's, this seems like an area where government would be well-suited to act swiftly to stop this from happening, but that isn't really the story here. It's not the story. And it's because the system is opaque. I, I don't, I believe that if, if the system had believed and seen what I was seeing, as early as I did, I think things would have, have stopped much more quickly. But the, these programs are, it's what they, they thrive on the desperation of desperate families for the private pay, and they thrive on the desperation of desperate states for, for public placements. Public placements come from school districts, they come in other states from juvenile justice, from child welfare systems. And they prey on the kids that have more significant needs or who, or who are difficult to place. Unfortunately, a lot of them aren't actually that, that difficult. They've been put in situations where they are trying to survive and their behaviors that are related to survival then label them as bad kids or troubled kids or broken kids. And that was the saddest thing when I was touring these facilities and talking to Oregon kids all of these different facilities, the kids unsolicited would say, I'm only here because I'm so bad, nobody in Oregon wants me. And to have a kid believe that their entire state does not want them it is just unfathomable to me. Once people saw what was really happening, it, things 
things sped up really quickly, but it, it took time to demonstrate it and, and blow the whistle. And Oregon is not alone. There's a facility in Illinois that I visited on the last day of July or close to the last day of July in 2019. I walked in within the first five minutes, I saw an inappropriate restraint. There weren't sheets on the beds. They had a, a ringworm outbreak. There was like fecal matter on the wall. It smelled bad. There was garbage everywhere. There was a kid in a body sock. Just all of it was, was terrible. I left and I cried. And then I reported it to everybody. And then I went and got um, restraint reports. We had, you know, documented. We had a little 10 year old, 12 year old girl there who was punched in the face, you know, oh signed God. off not substantiated for, for abuse. Kids that were put in these, and these were little kids. These kids were nine to 12, three of them that were there. They were put in 45 minute supine restraints. That's the type of restraint that killed Cornelius in 12 minutes. And I complained to everyone. I finally complained to the federal government. I complained to the joint commission. The federal government came and investigated in December of 2019, declared immediate jeopardy. They said every kid in that facility was at immediate risk of injury or death. Oregon pulled its kids out um, and uh, the federal government took its, its uh, credentials away, but the kids were all individual state pay from Illinois and other states. So not a single kid left. That program did not get shut down until about three weeks ago. It took that long. It's been two years of writing to what I felt like was every official in the state of Illinois. Kids have been raped. Uh, people have been arrested. There was a, a, a under 13 year old boy with autism who was strangled until he passed out by a staff person. These are not low level issues. And they're repeated in these programs all across the country. And they're hidden. They're not providing the information to the programs. And that is part of what I'm trying to do is lift the veil on that so people can see. And they're not even treatment programs. These places are not licensed as mental health programs. And the people that are buying it, both the state officials and the parents, don't know that. It's it's hidden. And I, you know, it's like Game of Thrones. I don't know if you ever watched Game of Thrones, but there's the White Walkers and Jon Snow, um, you know, seeing these White Walkers and everybody thinks he's crazy. I've just felt like this, I, you know, I'm part of this group that has seen the White Walkers and we just have to tell people and we have to change it. These places are not good for kids. Yeah, and so Senator, we have time for, for one more question. And I would, wow. I mean, I would imagine too, that there is uh, probably bipartisan support for, for some sort of change, right? I mean, I can't imagine a super progressive or a super conservative hearing about this and saying, this is fine. The system is working <laughs> as intended. Uh, I know we only have a couple minutes, but what are, is it like, you know, is it an activism perspective or just a not enough people talking about this? Is it a policy perspective? Does, again, as kind of Ben was saying, does someone need to pass a bill or what, what does kind of reform very broadly speaking look like uh, in this space and with some of these uh, scenarios that, 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 that you've described? Um, really, it's all of the above. It's advocacy and it's policy. The policy pieces, it's just wonky and nerdy to really dig into the details of regulation and how do kids move and what causes it to happen. Um, it requires partnership across the states because there isn't like a, a base requirement that spreads across the country. So I'm working with legislators in multiple states, including uh, Senator Mike McKell, who's a conservative Republican from Utah, actually, where he testified at my hearing. I went down for his bill signing. He took a bill that we passed here to reform Oregon's residential care programs, introduced that in this year's legislative session in Utah. They have more of these programs than anybody else passed it unanimously. It was the first time that they have updated standards for those programs in about 30 years. It's a really big deal. And it even brought protections to, to gay and trans kids in Utah, introduced by a conservative Republican. And he's still, you know, we're still working on it. Um, you know, we're trying to get in front of NCSL and CSG to bring forward model legislation. I've got a couple of pending bills that he wants to pick up and run next year in, in Utah, if we can get them done here and that's our benefit is we can start models here because the industry isn't big here and then the other states can can pick that up and move forward so that's um it's coalition work it really is coalition work that requires advocates and celebrities and kids and um legislators and that's part of what paris and i have talked about her influencer network and contacts are very very different than <laughs> mine we are very very different people um but you know working together and working with cinder mccowell um, we're able to get into a lot of networks and, and pull a lot of people into partnership. Well, I am thrilled that we could turn this conversation into a positive ending point because I was very concerned there for a while that this is sorry. Not, not, no, <laughs> I mean, really, really important stuff. And I'm grateful that um, you could you could kind of share all that um, and explain to, to folks who maybe are paying attention to politics, but don't know the details of what's going on 
our final question um, is if people are interested in your work or they maybe uh, in this case, we haven't said this before, but if they have a story they want to share with you that's relevant to this work, what's the best way for people to be in touch with you or to track the work that you're doing um, and to connect? Um, so email to my office is great. Um, I do all of my own uh, social media, primarily Twitter at this point. So DM me if you're interested in this kind of what we call the troubled teen industry work. The hashtag breaking code silence is one that um, that uh, will kind of get you to some of those some of those pieces as well. And, and an email, I will always get back to people during session. I'm unfortunately a little slower than I than I'd like to be, but awesome. Well, Senator, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I, I wish we had another hour um, because there's so, we were going to ask a couple other policy questions too, but we'll save that for the next episode. Um, everyone else, thanks for listening. Please remember to subscribe to the podcast, leave us a five-star rating. And we're also on Twitter. Uh, Mr. Titus here is our, uh, our, our Twitter guy. Uh, the handle is at Oregon Bridge Pod. Um, and we're looking to engage more there. So maybe we'll, uh, we'll tweet at the Senator and get a conversation going there. But thanks everyone for listening and we'll see you next time. Thank you.